Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the August 3rd, 2020 meeting for the Westchester Area School Board. Let's begin with a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Ms. Cherishore, let's do a roll call, please. Mr. Bevilacqua? Here. Ms. Chester? Ms. Chester? Mr. Durnell? Here. Mr. Gallen? Here. Dr. Herman? Here. Mr. McCune? Here. Dr. Shaw? Here. Mr. Spackman? Here. Mrs. Tiernan? Here. One more call for Ms. Chester, just in case she had herself on mute. No? Okay. There we go. Thank you, Ms. Cherishore. Can you please also add that we met uh, in, in the meeting minutes in exec session earlier tonight regarding school safety in a legal manner? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start tonight just by providing some uh, opening remarks and then we'll get to our, uh, our agenda here. So on behalf of the board, I want to start by thanking everyone that participated in the task force, everyone that submitted comments or emails, the folks that reached out to board members. There has been no shortage of stressors and everyone is longing for some return to some normalcy. Rest assured the board is committed to getting our students back in the classroom in some capacity as soon as possible while mitigating the risk and liability. All let's try to remain reasonable and positive. Uh, with that said, uh, we will move to public comments on agenda items. Uh, so I know we're going to have um, Dr. Sosgolowski cover all of the 675, maybe 700 uh, parent, uh, grouping them at least, uh, comments on uh, the item in terms of school opening. But first, we'll open it up and see whether anyone has signed up to comment on the personnel side of tonight's agenda. Mr. Wagman, have you seen anyone sign up? I'm going to turn that over to Ms. Neal, who is monitoring that. Okay. No, Mr. McCune, there are no comments at this time on public agenda items. Okay, thank you, Ms. Neal. All right, uh, Dr. Sokolowski, uh, can you uh, please uh, take some time to uh, group and categorize some of the concerns and, and the feedback from that we received? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. McCune. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, as Mr. McCune shared, the, the board solicited public comment on school reopening, and we received about 675 comments via email until about 12 noon today. Uh, all the comments were forwarded and reviewed by the board in advance of tonight's meeting. Uh, due to the volume, uh, what I will do is I will share a summary of these comments uh, broken down into seven different categories. Uh, so the most frequent area that we heard from uh, were community members, parents, students, teachers, uh, who expressed that they would prefer to open remotely uh, they indicated that they were relieved to hear this recommendation. Uh, their main reasons for supporting this recommendation were safety and consistency. Uh, they are worried to pick any other option under the present circumstances. Uh, a number of these parents also expressed that if we do open remotely, uh, there needs to be more consistency and expectations uh, and more synchronous instruction than was provided in the spring. Uh, the second area with the greatest frequency uh, we heard from 225 respondents uh, that supported opening either brick and mortar full time or under a hybrid schedule. Uh, these parents indicated that they wanted to open in person five days a week uh, or at least on a hybrid model. Uh, some of the reasons that they stated uh, were that children were not getting the virus as frequently as adults. Uh, the social emotional well being of students is more important than the fear of the virus. Uh, and many families who express childcare concerns. We also heard from a number of families uh, that had concerns for students for, that have special education needs or 504 concerns. 
uh, 29 parents indicated that they wanted their students with either 504s or IEPs uh, to attend in-person instruction. Uh, many of these families shared that remote learning in the spring was not effective for their children. Uh, we then heard from 29 parents uh, who simply stated that they had concerns that if we were to start school remotely, uh, they had strong concerns about childcare uh, and that we were placing families uh, in a very, very difficult position. Uh, we then heard uh, from 11 respondents that had concerns regarding the reevaluation timeline. Uh, these families all expressed that they would like to see an evaluation occur prior to Thanksgiving. Uh, we next heard from six families uh, who had already selected the cyber program uh, and these families stated that they selected the cyber program for the security of knowing what, there would, what their children uh, will be experiencing throughout the school year and would not have to worry about a plan where the students may learn remotely, then may be in a hybrid model, and then may be full-time uh, or that degree of vacillation. Uh, and then finally, we did hear from four families who expressed the importance for students to be able to continue uh, with their extracurriculars. Uh, most notable there were fall athletics uh, and other extracurricular activities that occur in the fall. Uh, so Mr. McCune, those are uh, a summary of the comments that we received uh, up until about 12 noon today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sokolowski. Uh, any comments or questions from board members on that feedback. I know we've all been going through those over the weekend here. Yeah, Mr. McCune, I would say that uh, all of those comments will be part of the minutes, the actual written comments themselves. So as the formal minutes are, are approved for the board, you will see those, all of the comments uh, for the public uh, as part of our formal minutes when we finish this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Scalin. Anybody else? Okay. All right, we'll move along to um, personnel recommendations. Dr. Ulmer. Well, good, good evening, Mr. McCune, Mrs. Tiernan, members of our school board. This is the personnel report for the special board meeting on August 3rd, 2020. In personnel events, I have communicated and delivered 26 voluntary transfers and eight involuntary transfers. Additionally, in an addendum that was created due to time constraints, in addition to administrative staff, the district is recommending Dr. Michael Garvin as the principal of Penn Wood Elementary School. Dr. Garvin comes to us from Avon Grove School District as an assistant principal, and we are extremely excited to have him join the Westchester Area School District family. Congratulations to Mike. Additionally, in supplemental contracts, we are presenting all of our fall 2020 supplemental contracts and all of our annual 2020-2021 supplemental contracts. I respectfully request for the approval of all the aforementioned items on our personnel report for this special board meeting on August 3rd, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ulmer. I'll entertain a motion to approve. First by Dr. Herman and second by uh, Dr. Shaw. I think both were on mute, but I both saw them say I, I so thank you. Um, any comments or questions on that? Seeing none, roll call, Ms. Sherishor. Dr. Herman. Still on mute, Dr. Herman. Yes. Dr. Shaw. Yes. Mr. Bevilacqua. Yes. Mrs. Tiernan. Yes. Mr. Turnell. Yes. Mr. Spackman. Yes. Mr. Gallen. Yes. Mr. McCune. Yes. Motion carries eight nothing. Thank you, Ms. Sherishor. Dr. Garvin, on behalf of the board, uh, we're very excited to have you. Welcome aboard. Uh, we will uh, look forward to getting together with you soon. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I can't wait to get started. Thank you for the warm welcome. Yeah, Dr. Garvin, congratulations. Welcome. Welcome to Westchester. And uh, we will we will be in touch working on your transition plan. Uh, needless to say, this is an extremely busy year. Uh, and and uh, we'll uh, we'll bring you we'll bring you right into the right into the fold as soon as we can. So thanks so much. And congratulations, Mike. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Scanlon was going to say fire instead of fold, but we'll let that go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, perfect. Well, we will move on to other business. Uh, I believe there's uh, a motion that uh, Dr. Shaw, you'd like to read? Yes. Um, approval is requested of the Faith School Reopening Health and Safety Plan. I so move. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Tiernan. Great. So we're going we're gonna to pause here, uh, and Dr. Scanlon is going to take us through uh, a revised part of his you know, slide deck that he presented last week with some modifications that uh, he's been making with the team uh, based on feedback and other changing variables. Dr. Scanlon, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me get this up. On our screens, everybody see that? Yep. Uh, let me just, I'm gonna go through, first of all, thank everybody for, um, again, all, all the feedback and just reiterate the comments that Mr. McCune made uh, at the start of this meeting. Uh, this has been a, a very, very challenging and difficult process. Uh, we have uh, engaged a lot of people, gotten a lot of information. I wanna, I wanna walk through some of the, some of the pieces of uh, some of the slides and information that we presented last week. Uh, also with some, some changes and just uh, listening to some of the feedback over the weekend. Uh, do appreciate the, um, the 675 comments that came in. Uh, I know that some people, uh, some of the comments in there, people felt like they were, they were being duped uh, because we were talking about, uh, first we started with our, our process to bring everybody in at three to five feet of social distancing. And then uh, with some of the changes to six feet, looking at a hybrid model, and then ultimately um, making a recommendation that we that we start with a with a virtual model, and I want to I'm going to walk through some of that with everybody uh, tonight be, before the board um, begins its its discussion. So I want to also look at a, a at a path forward, a path coming back uh, to in person instruction. As Mr. McCune said, it is it has always been our goal to bring kids back, get them back into our classrooms. Our our, our I know our parents want our kids back. I want my kids back. At, uh, our teachers want the kids back. So it has always been our goal to, to, to bring the students back into our schools. We wanna make sure that we're, we're doing it safely. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the supports and some of the changes that we've made to Remote 2.0 in terms of our online remote learning. And then, uh, and then we'll finish with, uh, with comments and discussion uh, with, with our school board. Guidance was something uh, last week we talked about. This is just a lot of the different guidance that we have, we have received and been watching uh, since May, again, we've had 19 or uh, six different sets of, of guidelines that have been issued since May 19th. The, the big problem, ultimately, our task is to open safely and, and bring students and staff in with, with plans to flex in and out of different delivery models. We've got to take a look at trajectory of the virus. We've got to take a look at, at some other key decision points as well. And here are those decision-making points that, that we have been using as as our guideposts, uh, state guidance, we've talked an awful lot about that. What guidance are we getting from, from health departments, from the governor's office, uh, from our local health departments? Community opinions and needs, they're, they're extremely mixed out there. They have been throughout this entire process, uh, beginning back in March. Uh, feasibility, we have to look at how feasible our options, again, and, and what is our staff support? That, that's a big piece as well. And trajectory of the virus, what, what's happening in the community and what are we, what are we learning more about? Uh, about the virus. So those are, those are the guideposts that we've been looking, looking at. Uh, the state guidance and communication uh, that, that the state has said, this is a local decision, uh, that schools about to be the ones to make the choices and accept the responsibilities. And that comes from uh, all levels, uh, all different uh, people, legislators, departments at the state level in Harrisburg. Uh, the science and the public opinion about, about the virus is, is still new and emerging. And I want to go back and, and just tell a little bit of the story as to how we got there and, and, and do we want to be this, this experiment. In March of 2020, if you remember, we closed Henderson High School because we had one student that, uh, that came in contact in a doctor's office in Montgomery County. That doctor had tested positive for COVID-19. There were a couple other high schools in the area, a couple other schools that, that went through the same thing. There was a lot of pressure because uh, the virus was just starting to, to show up in Pennsylvania. People were nervous and afraid. There was a lot of pressure to close not only Henderson, which we did for a day, uh, but, but then a week later, 
uh, the entire state of, uh, of Pennsylvania, all the schools were closed because there was, there was a lot of pressure and concern about this virus. In April, uh, we sent out a survey two weeks into uh, our, our remote learning that, uh, that we, had, uh, we had started. We were one of the first districts to put survey information out to people uh, to try to see what we can do, what we can improve. And, and, and we took that survey data and information and we made some improvements to our, our remote learning. By June, we had a multiple sets of guidelines again, and we began, well, we began once we ended the school year to, to train teachers on our, our, uh, our remote learning platform, knowing that we may end up uh, using some of that again uh, as, we, as we head into this school year. In July, a lot, a lot took place. We had task force groups, we were meeting, we were discussing opening of schools. We had more local and state guidance that was issued. We had uh, additional surveys out um, after the 4th of July holiday. Once some of the businesses started to open up, we started to see cases again rising in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we did a lot of staff training for, for online learning for uh, our, our cyber program, which we were preparing for. We started to see some staff requests uh, for information on the, on the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, which, which says that if there are some people who have uh, uh, a compromised immune system that uh, employers must provide uh, some uh, 12 week, up to 12 weeks of time off for that, uh, for that purpose. We did analysis of the hybrid model, looking at feasibility and implementation, and then ultimately uh, a recommendation to, uh, to open up virtually next, uh, uh, this year, we made that last week. Uh, this is the recommended decision. Again, begin with a remote 2.0. Uh, we have made uh, improvements over that. It's more synchronous, more live instruction. It, is, uh, it, it also has some recorded uh, capabilities in there for some flexibility for students to come back and watch again if they miss it or if they're sick. Uh, also, we offer a Westchester Cyber Program. Again, this was a program in our strategic plan that we were planning to offer at our secondary schools. It's more flexible, more asynchronous. That is still available, and we do have that um, available as well in our elementary program uh, this year uh, uh, for this purpose. We do want to reassess regularly. Now, this is something that we heard uh, that, that we want to evaluate uh, every three weeks so that we begin looking at the end of September uh, to potentially return sooner with a hybrid model. So we want to take a look at what's happening in the community with, with the virus. We want to see if there are some other districts around us that perhaps uh, start with a hybrid. How are, how are they doing with all of that? Uh, but we should also plan for, for our change to potentially occur sometime after the Thanksgiving break uh, so we will do assessments along the way, but, uh, but our goal would be at Thanksgiving to ultimately, uh, if, if possible, bring everybody back. Uh, some components of the plan, again, we have uh, parents can choose between remote 2.0 or the Westchester Cyber. We have our middle and high schools on a block schedule that's set up so that they can phase in and out of, uh, of the remote uh, program, hybrid program, or back into the brick and mortar with everybody in uh, so that we don't have to keep changing schedules. Our, our low incidence uh, disability students are going to receive services in schools when necessary. That's as long as we stay in the green and yellow phase. Uh, we have been running a summer program uh, for our students uh, with, with uh, the low incident disability students. That was approved by the board in June. That does have six feet of social distancing with masking requirements and all the hygiene pieces that are in our plan. Uh, we are uh, also working to try to deliver some services to English language learners and we'll still uh, tease that out. Uh, as we go through this, these next few weeks. Uh, we are also working with local child care providers. That was some of the, the concerns and, and, uh, and questions we heard about uh, child care, we provide some child care options for, for staff and parents. Uh, our reopening team will continue to look at some of these other areas, uh, performing arts, extracurricular clubs, that we want to run those uh, virtually after school. Uh, our sports programs, we also have approved our um, our summer workout programs for our sports teams. Uh, we think it is important to, uh, to, to continue with workouts with kids. The board did approve that plan, that safety plan back in June. That also has social distancing, masking for the, for the coaches, uh, all outside only. That is outside only uh, for, for the sports teams. So we're recommending that we continue with those outside only workouts, uh, at least through that first evaluation time of our, our virtual program. Some of our, our highest need students, again, these are uh, some of the, the, the low incident disabilities kids. 
and uh, we, will, we will continue to deliver services with them and bring them in uh, whenever possible. The whole reopening process and, and the decision, it, is, it has been agonizing. It has been uh, virtually impossible because uh, ultimately what we wanna do is have the best educational uh, position for our kids, but most of what we're doing is not really educationally sound and we pick any of, any of these, these options. Um, we want to make sure that it, it is the safest pos possible option uh, to bring kids in, uh, especially in absence of, of some of the state direction that, that we're not getting. Uh, we looked at the hybrid model. It has some logistical and, and educational challenges, uh, especially with uh, the threat of possible uh, regular quarantines and closures. Uh, if we end up opening going in a hybrid model and we, and we have to then close schools a couple of days into it, uh, now we have very little time to set up some of those child care centers for, for the, uh, the five day a week program. Uh, we, we have, uh, uh, it's much easier if we go from the, uh, from the virtual model into a hybrid because we can, we can plan for the absolute worst and, and start to phase in for some of the things that, that are better. Uh, some people have said, well, this is, a, this is a political decision. It's politically motivated. Uh, I would tell you that this is not politically motivated. Uh, we, are, we are not politicians, we are educators, and we are working to do the best we can for the students in this school district. Uh, we join colleagues nationwide who have been trying to figure all of this out and have agonized in, in these decisions. Uh, there's no good solutions, but we are definitely committed to our students and to our families. These were the guiding principles that, that we covered last week. Uh, they haven't really changed. Looking at safety is certainly the first and foremost priority of our students and our staff. Uh, equity, we wanna make sure that we are getting access to kids who, who may not have it. Monitoring student needs, we, we, we gotta do that. We, uh, we wanna look as this pandemic approves also to try to bring uh, kids back and, and beginning with youngest kids first uh, if, in, if we get that opportunity to do that. And there has to be flexibility flexing in and out of these different programs. Our task force was, was extremely important and, and the commitment of our staff uh, again, the in-person instruction is, is our ultimate goal, and we will move back to in-person with a hybrid model uh, as soon as we possibly can. All of the work that we did and all of the vetting that we did and all of the, uh, the different scenarios that we worked out, it was not lost. It was not work that was, that was not valued, uh, and it was, it was critically important in this whole process. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll evaluate every three weeks uh, beginning on September 25. We got to look at virus numbers. Uh, we are not expecting zero cases. That is not our criteria. Uh, that was an example. That was, uh, that was some, had, somebody had sent a couple of emails earlier about, uh, well, you're using a criteria of zero cases. That was an example. As, uh, if we got that from the Department of Health, then, then that's what we would do. Uh, our, our guidelines are gonna come from the Chester County Department of Health. And, um, and, and we wanna make sure that we're following the guidance uh, from, from that that Department of Health. Uh, if other schools are on a hybrid doing well, and, and again, Health Department says we're okay, then we will work to bring and start transition kids back uh, as early as October if we see signs there. Every three weeks, we wanna propose uh, that we evaluate again a, a, after September 25th, and uh, we'll use the, the Chester County Health Department data. Now, under 5% of, uh, of, of uh, cases testing positive, 4%, I mean, I don't know what any of these numbers mean. There are people throw them around. Some states are saying it should be a 2% before it's safe to bring kids back. Some are saying uh, in New York, 4%. But we're going to need our health department to help us guide through all of this data and these, uh, these, these data points and these decision points. Um, look at other schools around us. Are they closing? Are they, are they, uh, are they getting positive cases? Uh, and can we, bring, can we bring the students back again, uh, looking at youngest students? and maybe even doing some uh, work with our seniors because there's some, uh, there's some instructional pieces that they may need for future successes in terms of, uh, of, of applying for college and making college applications. So we need to know what kinds of supports that, that we need uh, in place to make, make all of this happen. Question about why are we recommending 100% virtual reopening? Uh, if, if it's temporary, if it's, if it's only 20% that chose uh, in the latest survey, uh, again, Survey data is one piece of information that, that we're looking at. We've always been working with the concept of bringing our students back. Uh, and some of the data and decision points have tipped. 
Uh, this is temporary. We hope to get back in person as soon as possible, but ultimately safety is the big emphasis and continuity. Uh, some, some epidemiologists believe that, that schools are gonna close soon after they reopen. Uh, in fact, I heard from two different ones last week at a, at a superintendent's meeting. Uh, they had two different opinions. One said, we should probably not even bring kids back until October 1st at the earliest. Another one said, well, you can bring them back with social distancing, uh, the six feet, the masks, all of those safety pieces, but there is risk and there's a good chance that shortly after you open, you may end up closing. So you get different opinions from, from different medical people uh, who are specializing in infectious diseases. So why should we be the test case? We looked at feasibility and, and decisions of, of surrounding districts, as many districts around us were going with fully virtual model. That does have a rippling effect on, on other school districts, has an effect on staffing, uh, has, has an effect on, uh, on building subs, uh, when we, we anticipate that the numerous staff that we have that, that may have compromised immune systems, and they've been advised by doctors that in-person school might be too great of a risk uh, for, them, for them to start the year. Um, building substitutes, trying to go out and get building subs if people are out. We said if people are sick, we've said this to parents, we've said this to staff, make sure that you stay home and don't, don't bring illness into, into our schools. Uh, that creates some, some issues with how do you, how do you maintain the even in a hybrid model, how do you maintain the, the online aspect of that when, when people are remoting in uh, and then also managing the, uh, the in-person aspect of it? It's very difficult to be a sub under the best of conditions and, and there's, there's a shortage of subs out there already. Some of the logistical challenges, I've talked about that. I think a remote start sets us up for a stronger hybrid model. It is much easier to phase in from, from a remote model to a hybrid than to go the other way. And uh, again, there are some concerns about schools having to frequently close. A, a recent University of Texas study uh, estimated that two positive cases in the first week of schools of 500, uh, that, and they've done uh, that analysis by county around the, around the country. Uh, ultimately, we have to protect the continuity of education, and we are not gonna fail our students. Uh, this is a slide from last week about the remote schedules. These are the requirements that we have to follow. Uh, these are some questions that, that came up about accessing instruction. Uh, again, this slideshow will be available up on the, uh, on the website. Uh, that is also in last week's slideshow, those, those particular slides. We have made a difference with a robust professional development for instructional staff. Uh, we can now put all efforts focused on this remote 2.0. So we have had uh, training throughout the summer uh, because we knew there was gonna be some form of online learning in, in the various models that, that we were looking at. Uh, we also look at, at a variety of areas, including engaging students online, differentiating instruction, uh, how to do small group instruction, how to assess student progress, building online classroom communities. All of these are topics that we've been working with our staff and will continue to do so be before the, the start of the school year. Block scheduling, how do, you, how do you maximize and organize that time for our secondary students? We, we've got uh, instruction going and professional development for our staff and that. We have some uh, national organizations such as Apple and Dell that have been helping us along with our own uh, technology support staff to, uh, to make all of that happen. We're using some of our state and federal uh, grant money to, to pay for all of this so that we can in fact put all of our focuses for the start of the school year. Some people say, well, what about kids who don't learn well with remote learning? We learned a lot last spring. Uh, we have more synchronous, uh, a more robust schedule that will be better to support our kids. We, we know that uh, teachers will be conducting small groups, some one-on-one -on -one sessions with students. Uh, there's increased communication with parents, better ways for parents to communicate through our learning management system. Uh, our instructional aides will work closely with teachers. Uh, for the students that have uh, IEPs, the Individual Education Plan and the, and the Section 504 plans of, of, uh, of their IEPs, uh, they'll get regular follow-up and intervention when needed. Teachers uh, are permitted and encouraged to teach in their classrooms. Many teachers have already asked about that. So that as they come in to utilize the resources in their rooms and teach remotely from their classrooms out to the students. Lots of questions about social emotional support and, and, and we have pieces put together for that. Uh, we've been working on the first 20 days to, for the elementary teachers to, to make sure that they're getting to know the students. Uh, our counselors have been working 
all summer long, meaning twice a, twice a week throughout the summer, to, to put together uh, some plans to help with, with the social, emotional, the mental health specialists. Trauma-informed training is, is a requirement this year as well. Here's a table and a slideshow about counseling and mental health professionals. And, and we have increased our mental health services from six and a half staff to nine staff. We, uh, we continue with uh, developmental programming for relationship building. Uh, the technology, we've, we've, we've made some changes to technology again to make it easier for parents to access and get help with their children if they see some of the counseling and mental health needs that, that have to take place. So we've spent an awful lot of time uh, improving with that, uh, that aspect in the remote world. Uh, some technology, all, all uh, K to five students, some parents have asked, well, are my kids gonna be assigned uh, a, tech, uh, a tech device? Yes, all K to five students will be assigned iPads. Some of the buildings have already uh, put out information for, for pickups for those. Uh, and that was going to happen regardless of the model that, that we choose. Uh, all six to 12 students are assigned laptops. Uh, incoming sixth and ninth graders would be, would be uh, that, that may be new to the system or any, any student that may be new will also be uh, assigned assign devices uh, in order to, to make things happen, uh, to, to access the curriculum. We made some infrastructure upgrades looking at bandwidth and security and uh, students if they, if they need some workbooks and textbooks, we also will make that available to try to reduce some of the screen time. Again, I've talked about, uh, about professional development. The after school sports and activities. This is also part of, of mental health. And, and again, we wanna continue with our workout schedule uh, that we've been doing this summer. That again was approved in June. We do have social distancing pieces in there. Uh, we will not have any competitions uh, until we can complete that first review in September. And we wanna make sure we see what's happening around us. It's my understanding, I heard today that the governor is going to announce some new guidelines for, uh, for sports for the fall. So we're not quite sure what that will be, but once we get that on Wednesday, that will certainly help us as we, uh, as we develop our plans. Our athletic directors uh, and part of our, our task force have been working on altern uh, alternate activities. They've been doing that for about a month now. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have kids involved in activities. We wanna make sure that we're doing it safely. Uh, and that is a good relief for some of the mental health pieces that we've been talking about in some of these earlier, sli earlier slides. Uh, one of the things our athletic directors have asked, and, and can they have competitions just between our high schools if there are no other competitions? That's something that we can certainly look at, but that's gonna have to be driven by safety first. Child care was another piece that, that, that came up in many of the comments, and uh, we, we're working on affordable child care, setting up some child care centers. A child's place is our, is our child care provider for before and after care in our schools, so they are licensed in all of our buildings. So we are looking at setting up uh, seven of, of our buildings as sites for child care for our staff and for our parents. Uh, so we will have more information about that uh, as we get that all, all finalized. So why can child care operate but, but not schools? Child care is a, is a much smaller contained group. Uh, there are limits to how many students we'll be able to have in those child cares, but this is an essential service that's provided by the, by the child care centers. Uh, and again, a child's place will be supervising the online learning as kids need to access uh, from those child care centers. Other community centers, several churches have, uh, have, have reached out and said we'd be willing to help. Uh, we, have, we have some child care centers that, that we can actually open up for parents as well. Uh, Westminster, uh, Goshen Baptist, Advent Lutheran, just a couple of churches that, that have reached out. So we're looking at other locations in the community for that as well. And then for affordability, a sliding scale, uh, so that we, we, will, we will try to work with all families uh, to provide options that are affordable uh, to help with the child care concerns. Support staff, what does it mean for virtual online learning? Uh, our instructional staff will be part of, the, part of the process, secretaries, technology support, our custodial staff, uh, cafeteria staff are gonna have to provide uh, lunches for families who qualify. We've been doing that all summer. Uh, we did that all through the spring as well. Questions about transportation, some people ask about. So uh, who, who's gonna run the transportation? Well, well, we'll run transportation for the programs that, uh, that, that we're running. Uh, the state law requires us to provide similar services to all of our, our private schools it requires us to provide services for charter schools, 
So, uh, so we will have to look at the, the services that we provide for our students. We would have to provide similar services for those, uh, uh, for those private schools. We have about 147 different privates and charters that, that we do provide transportation to. Crafts Bus Company and On The Go Kids are the, are the transportation contractors and we'll work closely with them. Uh, some of the differences, these were some of the slides from, again from last week, what's the difference between uh, Westchester Cyber uh, uh, and, and the, and the, the 2.0, I think uh, the Remote Learning 2.0, this slide is a, is a pretty good comparison. Uh, as you can see, Remote 2.0 uh, in the elementary option, uh, you'll be assigned to your, your own brick and mortar teacher in your school. Uh, you, you'll have uh, one live, one math uh, lesson each day. You'll see more synchronous in, in this, this particular model. Westchester Cyber students will be assigned to, uh, to this program. It is not necessarily going to be a teacher from your, your child's school. It may be, but they are Westchester teachers from around the district. We have had uh, uh, almost 670 uh, parents uh, inquire about Westchester Cyber and sign up for that. So we have had uh, an awful lot of people with a lot of interest in, in that program. Again, these schedules are sample schedules that we, we went through last week. They are available on our website. All the information uh, about these schedules and about our different cyber pro our Westchester cyber program uh, and remote learning can be found on the website. Specifically to Westchester cyber, uh, we have an entire section on the website for the Westchester cyber. This is a sample elementary schedule. All of these orange areas are areas that, uh, that are live sessions uh, for the week. And for the secondary, uh, we have this table again that makes a comparison between remote 2.0 and then the Westchester Cyber Program. Again, this is a little more asynchronous, a little bit more self-paced. There, uh, there are lessons that are built in throughout, throughout the week. Um, this is gonna be a, little more, a, lot, a lot more synchronous, a lot more scheduled for four periods of the day. We'll be taking attendance uh, each of the periods. We'll be taking attendance each day also in our Westchester Cyber Program. Remote, uh, remote 2.0, here's an example of, of some live, what live, the orange would be live sessions uh, on a daily session for a secondary with the four blocks so that uh, students will have four classes a day that they will, uh, they will be uh, learning. Uh, that will go every other day for their eight periods. So one through four on, on one day and then five through eight on, on the second day. Again, this is a sample schedule for the cyber program, the orange uh, in Westchester cyber. There are fewer uh, synchronous classes, but these orange would be the synchronous classes in the secondary Westchester cyber. Some of our uh, special education and, and English language learners, they also will be provided with an opportunity in our cyber program uh, and the individual education plans and the teams will be working with parents to deliver those programs with some synchronous and some asynchronous. This was a slide uh, we have last we put out last week and also uh, as part of our, our, our presentations up on the website. This is what a classroom looks like with uh, three or four feet apart. You can get 28 to 30 desks. This is what a class looks like when you're when you're going six feet apart. You get about 14 or 15 desks. So our pathway back is is looking for constant communication and evaluation of, of our program. We need to do that. So we'll begin the year fully online for the school district. Then we wanna move back to a hybrid model, which is two to three days a week uh, in, in school, two to three days a week virtual. That will also include some, uh, some, some uh, uh, cyber learning and some, some remote learning as well. And then eventually move everybody back in person with a three to five feet of separation. We still offer the cyber, Westchester cyber throughout the year. And then ultimately, not on this slide, but ultimately bring everybody back, get us back close to normal as we possibly can. Uh, cleaning procedures are in our, are in our plan. Uh, contact tracing procedures are also in our plan. It is, it, is an, it is really an impossible choice. And all of these options are stressful for, for parents, for students, and, and for our, our school staff. There are some benefits to some options. There are some many challenges for all, all of the options. And there's feasibility concerns that we certainly have to, to look at. But we care very much about the welfare of our students and our staff and our families. And we wanna, we wanna make sure that we're making the, the best, best possible choices. 
So my final thoughts before I, I turn it over uh, to the school board and, and Mr. McCune, uh, it is still a global pandemic out there and, and the science is still emerging. Um, none of the options are good as, as, as we've been saying all along. We all have to work together. We, we do need flexibility to move in and out of these different scenarios, but there are many questions remain. We are committed to communicating progress, to communicating our evaluation pieces and, and staff groups will continue to meet frequently to problem solve as any other problems come up as, as we work to opening up this, this school year. We are committed to doing the best we can for our students and we will make this as positive a school year as we possibly can. So with that, Mr. McCune, I will turn it back to, to you and the board. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Scanlon. Appreciate you running us through the, the latest updates to the, to the overall report. Uh, we'll start off with obviously, you know, Q&A. Uh, if anyone has questions from their own thoughts or questions they read from, from some of the comments uh, over the last uh, four or five days, we can share them. And then uh, we'll go to, you know, obviously sharing any thoughts that you want to share before we get to our vote. Um, so I'll, I'll lead off Dr. Scanlon with the um, you know, one question I think I saw in a couple of the emails was, you know, so keep making sure that we'd be able to hit the number of mandated hours and you know, we won't slip behind fall behind as we're rolling out the, uh, the online. Yeah, as far as the mandated hours, and as you know, the, the General Assembly passed legislation last June that, that requires us to, to put those hours in. So uh, we, have, uh, we have submitted a, a plan uh, to, to, to say that the hours that we are, we are logging will add up to the 900 hours for elementary and 990 for secondary uh, and the 180 days. So, so our, our plan does include that. Uh, the assignments that teachers will be doing, they have to grade them. Uh, they, have to, they have to make sure that, that there are enough hours that are, that are being assigned uh, to make sure that we meet that. Typically in our school year, we are well over the 900 and 990 in this school district because our, our, our days are a little bit longer than most. Uh, and we typically go 182 days, which we do have in our calendar. Uh, so, so we have a couple of extra days built in as well. Okay, thank you Dr. Scott. One more for, for me and then I'll, I'll pass around here. Uh, I saw in our deck we were talking about obviously to see what we can do with the high school aspect of it. I know we approved both supplementals for middle school and high school and middle school starts a little bit later in the high school in terms of their, their sports. It's the same plan to try to have them have some type of workouts like we did at the high school level. Yeah, our plan does cover all secondary. We, we just typically in the, in the summer, we do bring in just the high school kids. Uh, because that, that does get into more PIAA high school competitions. Uh, but the plan does cover middle school. We can certainly have our, our, uh, our athletic and after school um, task force take a look at that uh, in terms of, of where do we want to start doing some of those, uh, those after school activities for some of the middle school kids. Uh, again, with social distancing, with masking, with all of those safety precautions all outside. Thank you, Dr. Scalen. All right, let's go around the horn here. Uh, Daryl, uh, Mr. Rodell, anything to uh, ask questions about? Um, no questions. I just wanted to make a comment about the, the enormous support uh, from teachers that really have expressed a real concern for each kid, each staff member, and each family. Um, I, I think we've taken a very balanced approach, and it's a difficult process, but I'm glad we're moving ahead. Uh, Dr. Shaw? Yes, I don't have any uh, questions either, but I, I do want to say that um, I have been really proud to be a part of this team as um, the leadership in the school district and the people on the task force and community members have weighed in with, you know, their thoughtful analysis and their recommendations. And um, I just want to assure everybody that um, nobody should doubt for a minute that the board and the administration are acting in the best interest of the of um, the schools and of children and of teachers um, and in the final analysis we simply have to put the safety of our students and our staff first um, so i'm happy to that we're moving forward and this was a really difficult decision but i believe that we were given all the information that we need in order to to make uh, a good decision this evening thank you dr shaw mrs Tierney. You're, there, you go. there we are. The question tonight was how to open safely. 
We do not exist, alas, in a bubble of safety. I wish we did. We know that teaching at its best takes place in a place, in a room with teachers and students together. However, at this time, with and with regular ongoing reassessments, I support the motion to open virtually, and I think it's the best one going forward. I echo what Dr. Shaw said, this work has taken thousands and thousands of hours of uh, deliberation, and it is made with the best intentions for all. Thank you, Mrs. Tiernan. Uh, Dr. Herman? Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Scanlon, and I wanted to thank his cabinet and anyone else in the school district that is helping out. Um, through my years of being in the Westchester Area School District as a teacher and now on the school board, the one thing that is always amazing is how people come together and we always do the best for students. Um, I have heard rumors that Dr. Scanlon and his cabinet are up all night, <laughs> seven days a week. They are working very, very hard for our students. They are working hard for everyone in the community. Um, I appreciate all the comments that, you know, we, we read through them through the weekend. Um, very, very good comments. I think each comment was just as valuable as the next comment that came along. But I want um, the community, I want the teachers, I want all of um, everyone to know, just like Dr. Shaw and Mrs. Tiernan, we are here for the students and we will make the best decision for them. So I, um, I support everything that all of the work that Dr. Scanlon and his cabinet and everyone else did. And I thank everybody for us being such a great group of people in the Westchester Area School District. We're here for the kids and we need to continue being for them and we will. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Mr. Sackman. You all move in. There you go. There you go. Um, so, Dr. Scan, when do you think we'll get more information about the child care uh, parameters? I know you guys are working uh, with a couple of different options out there. So I know that's a big thing on people's shoulders. Yeah, we we hope to have uh, we hope to have something out by the end of the week. I know that Dr. Nissett was uh, was meeting with some of those uh, those centers today. Uh, she was working last week with with a child's place. Um, Dr. Missa, do you have an update on, on, on contacts you've made with, with the uh, child care centers? I do. Uh, thanks, Dr. S Dr. Scanlon. So I have been in touch with uh, a child's place. They will be in seven of our buildings full time, meaning seven to six. Um, we are calling um, our child care centers across the district a pop-up daycares. Um, we met with Advent Lutheran, who is um, going to host some of our kids we met i met with uh ebs who's on 202 across um starkweather and stetson um i talked to the melton center so yes we I, I just have to finalize and as dr scanlon said i will attempt to finalize it by the end of the week but i hope to have some child care for uh both staff and families by the end of the week no that's that's great thank you very much because i know these are very stressful times for everybody. I know that's a huge thing on people's shoulders of myself having three um, children in the uh, district. I wanna thank everybody for the work they're doing and, and all. I know kids learn better in the classroom. That's what classrooms are designed to be. It's, teachers love being in front of the students and I'm glad we're keeping, we're, we're, we keep rechecking the situation because we're in uncharted territory. Uh, you know, These are new waters right now and um, all we can do is go through this together. So thank you. And Mr. Spackman, if I can just elaborate just a little bit, uh, we are also going to make sure that the, the people that are staffed at these uh, pop-up daycares, in addition to our buildings, um, will will facilitate the learning for the kids in the in that room. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spackman. Mr. Gallon. Uh, no questions, but I will have some some comments before we vote. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Bevelacqua. 
Yeah, I also have no questions. I do have a statement. Do you want me to read it now, like some people did, or do you want me to wait? Sure, go ahead, Mr. Redlockle. Okay, just a couple thoughts. Anyway, this is one of the most challenging decisions the school board's made in my three terms as school board director. I've read over 800 emails from parents, teachers, neighbors, friends that were sent in the last week since Dr. Scanlon did the presentation last week to the community. The response, in my opinion, is really a split, 50-50 in all cases. Um, on the hybrid versus the remote 2.0 education to start the school year. I fully understand the hardship the remote decision has on dual parent working families with daycare needs. Families with multiple school age children is making the remote education work. I also understand the other end on the concern for the safety of the students and teachers and also for the multi-generational families who are caring for elderly parents in their homes. The administration has worked entirely with the teaching staff to strengthen the remote 2.0 curriculum with additional live instruction lessons, as Dr. Scanlon mentioned, to ensure the best education could be provided in this remote fashion. There's a lot of apprehension on the parts of both the teachers and the students returning to school due to the potential of contracting the virus or spreading the virus. The administration's top priority and the top priority of our school board is the safety, health, and welfare of our students. That's the most important element. We cannot consciously vote to return to school, even in the hybrid model, in these uncertain times for the start of the school year. We all hope in the near future, as Dr. Scanlon mentioned earlier, that we can transition back to school in the hybrid mode in the near term. For these reasons, I'll be voting in favor of the recommendations of Dr. Scanlon to start the school year in a remote model. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bevelacqua. I'll uh, flip back to Mr. Gallon for his uh, final comments. Sure. Sure, there, you know, there have been a lot of unknowns during this crisis, but, but the things that we do know are that children thrive on routine and, and being in supportive social environments. We know that the loss of human connections for many of these kids is driving increases in stress, anxiety, and depression. We know that schools are fundamental to child development and provide our children with not only academic instruction, but help with social and emotional skills physical, speech, and mental health therapy is an even opportunity for physical activity. It's hard to provide all of this virtually, and that's why I will be voting no tonight. I'm in favor of a hybrid model uh, moving forward to, you know, back to normal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallon. Uh, Dr. Scott, a quick question for you, and then I'll provide my final thoughts, and we'll go around for the vote there. Um, What's the latest on the county, the school districts in the county? Where do they stand in terms of what their plans are at this point? Uh, I would say most of them um, have have chosen to start with a a virtual um, a virtual remote model. Uh, I think there are um, there's two voting tonight on plans. I think one is a one is a hybrid, one is a virtual. Uh, there was another district that is voting. Um, not quite sure what the final plan is going to be, but I but I believe uh, the remaining districts uh, are if they if they already have most I would say six of them have already approved a a virtual plan perhaps seven uh, and there may be another one tonight so I would say a, a good majority of the of the Chester County school districts are are going uh, are going virtual some of the ones in Montgomery County and some of the larger ones that I've been in touch with because. I think it's important for, for people to recognize that these larger districts have just different, uh, different challenges than some of the smaller districts. Uh, North Penn was one that was uh, developing a hybrid model. They too decided to, to, in the end, go virtual. They just approved that last Thursday, I believe. Um, was Hicken School District, these are Montgomery County School Districts, was, uh, was set up to do a, a hybrid and ended up going virtual. So I think, I think as, as, as we get closer to the start of the school year, you're seeing more and more school districts in this four county area that are, that are, that are choosing this, this option a little bit safer, concerned about uh, whether they'll be able to staff all of the, all the schools as, uh, as, as people start to get sick and you can't cover the subs, um, which means then if you're looking for a math teacher and you have kids that aren't gonna receive math instruction uh, or world language or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so, there's, so there's some concerns. But in Chester County, I would say a vast majority of the districts in Chester County uh, are going to start with a virtual look. Keep keep assessing. Uh, I think for us to to say we're you know we're going to start virtually uh, with Thanksgiving that first marking period, but but do those reviews along the way. If we can get back sooner, I would love to do that. Um, but I think people need to plan a little bit long term, but but expect some some evaluations and assessments along the way for for perhaps bringing 
if not all, some of the students back a little bit sooner. Thank you, Dr. Skeelan. Appreciate the uh, broader perspective there. So I, I'd like to echo your sentiments. Uh, I, I agree that we remain in a tough spot and our options are less than ideal. I'm not going to debate the medical science. There's just too much conflicting information out there. We all have different feelings and degrees of acceptable risk. Personally, I have five kids in the district, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to what many of our parents are going through. I was prepared to bring them back as a parent, but my vote tonight is one of a board member, not of a parent. While I can determine the level of acceptable risk for myself and my family, I feel less comfortable making that decision for 12,000 students and 1,200 staff at this juncture. Many folks have cited just ha have people opt in for the online and those who come can sign waivers. Unfortunately, the waivers are not worth the paper they're print on, unless we can prove that we were meeting the CDC guidelines. Um, that is where my hangup is. Our ability as a district, and this goes for any organization, to meet the CDC guidelines on a consistent basis at scale will be a challenge. While I'm voting for tonight for the proposed virtual plan, I remain committed to getting all of our students back as soon as possible, as soon as safely possible, and finding a way to continue athletics as much as feasibly possible in the meantime. Uh, this will allow us to you know, further validate our approach uh, and, and test what's going on out there in, and outside, which is a good thing. Um, so with that, I'll be voting yes to the proposed plan. Any other final comments? I'll go by head nods here, otherwise we'll get to it. Okay, Ms. Sherish, roll call, please. Dr. Shaw. Yes. Mrs. Tiernan. Yes. Mr. Bevilacqua. Yes. Dr. Herman. Yes. Mr. Gallen. No. Mr. Brunel. Yes. Mr. Spackman. Yes. Mr. McCune. Yes. Motion carries eight to one. Thank you, Ms. Sherishor. Okay, uh, we're on to our next item here, which is comments from residents on non-agenda items. Uh, Mr. Wagman, has anyone signed up? Ms. Neal? Any... No, not at this time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Wagman. All right, well, we'll end in our usual fashion with a quote. And again, this quote is about hope. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, motion to adjourn. First by Mr. Janelle, so you're shaking your head, and the second by Mr. Spackman, who raised his hand. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you, everybody. We'll see you again later this month. Thanks, everyone.